Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody loves Raymond fans. We are live once again. And today we have a really good show. Hello. Hello, Paula. How are you? Hello, England. Hello, United Kingdom. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited. Uh, today we'll be talking to Mike Royce. And I don't know if you had a chance to... Um, hello, Grace. Can you hear me okay? If you had a chance to look at some of those older photos that I posted, uh, you get an idea. Hello in Istanbul. Julia. Is that pronouncing it correctly? Julia. Very nice. Hello, Barbara. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, if you did see those pictures, if you scroll to the right, uh, on the last one I posted, you can see um, going back to stand-up comedy days and SNL, then Everett's Raymond, and then uh, almost you're seeing into the future because we're seeing Monday's premiere episode of One Day at a Time which is great. Uh, so, um, yes, I'm reading. <laughs> Hello, Pam. Hello, Pam. Uh, Mike wrote some of the fan favorite episodes. We're going to talk about tissues episode, the tissues episode. We have a lot of questions about the genesis of that episode, about the fire in the episode, etc. cetera. Uh, so hopefully Mike can answer uh, a bunch of those. Uh, and if Mike is listening and if he has trouble, because uh, sometimes I, I personally have tried to join Instagram Lives and it doesn't give me the option, then I just restart um, Instagram. Hello, Barbara. Yes. Hello, everybody. Wow, look at all these great... And again, I feel bad because... Two Purple Fish has joined. And I don't know what your... I know that's not on your birth certificate, Two Purple Fish. Hello, Susan. Yes, hello. Hello. Hello, people around the world. Yes, Istanbul, Toronto. Good, yes, a big Canadian fan base. Toronto is a big Canadian fan base. Uh, let me just see. Yes. Toronto, Ontario there. Hello, Teresa. So let me just check. Great. Checking to make sure. Now, uh, last week we talked to Larry Babbitts. Larry is the craft services from Eros Raymond. I'm hoping that he can come back again. Uh, he's a very humble guy, so he doesn't really... Um, you know, I had to pull the soup stories out of him. But the soup... Uh, uh, was a big part of people gathering in the kitchen, which, as we know, that's where, when you're having a party, that's where people seem to wind up. Even if you live in a, uh, a rather luxurious large house, which I do not, but I know people that do, uh, you end up gathering in the kitchen. And that's what happened with uh, Larry's kitchen. And then once he started getting into... Uh, making the soups, we would all gather, and, gather around and, and um, you know, try and get some of the soup. But also, it's a little bit of uh, time to catch up because everything is really, um, really working the whole week. And that show day gathering in Larry's kitchen just allowed you to you know, casually talk, which we didn't have that often. By the way, I'm, I have a lot of headroom for those of you who are photographers because once Mike joins, the frame gets cut in half. So all of this goes away. So if I make it look perfect now, a uh, little tidbit for you technical people. Um, yes, the car crashing um, in the house episode, yes. The Wallpaper episode written by Lou Schneider. Uh, we will find, and this is a challenge, um, we will have a lot of people on. Let me just see. Let me just check to make sure that Mike. Uh, everybody that I can have on the show, you know, Patty Heaton is on Instagram. So, 
Uh, we can have, you know, Patty, I was texting with Patty and she's going to come on. Every, everybody will come on uh, who has Instagram. So it's a little problematic because not everybody is on Instagram. Lou Schneider, who wrote the wallpaper episode, which is the episode about the car coming through the wall, he is not on Instagram. So uh, that's, you know, we'll have to get somebody who has, now Lou has kids, maybe his kids can come over with Instagram. Uh, let me just text Mike and make sure. Okay. Okay, great. Let me just hit this button. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so Amy Aquino, Carly asks, has Amy Aquino been interviewed? Uh, by the way, these questions don't come up when we post it. So after we're live and then I post it, the questions disappear. So that's why I will sometimes repeat a lot of your questions. So has Amy Aquino, who played the cookie lady, has she, uh, has she been on? Not yet. Uh, and actually, she was going to do it uh, in November. So I see Amy uh, every once in a while and she will be a great uh, thing. Okay, there's Mike. Hello from Swindon, Wilshire. UK. Did I pronounce that correctly? I hope so. Okay. So now let's see uh, how we're doing here. Yes. Connecting to Mike Royce. The tension is palpable. Hello. I'm here. Hello, Michael. And you, you see, is it supposed to be I see half your face? Because that's better than your any of it. What? Well, uh, here we go. I, oh, I just said, <laughs> I just said, by the way, what's funny, Mike, is coming from New York, now you're upstate New York, but so our audience, we, I don't know if you heard any of it, but our, we have an audience, uh, we have Istanbul, we have Sweden, we have UK, uh, Australia has not checked in yet, uh, Long Island, yes, so Long Island would relate. So, yeah, we're from the East Coast, so insulting people and being mean to them is apropos like that doesn't phase us at all it's the it's a cultural tradition <laughs> right and so you're insulting my shot which what, what i said before is before you came on i said you know i have this shot this way because it's going to divide in two and all of a sudden you'll just see you know half of my head and then you came out and said right yeah. away yeah. uh yeah. by the way i mike i don't first of all thank you for joining um he, here's what's going to happen we are going to run out of time Okay. okay. So you have uh, uh, a lot of stories. So I'm asking you right away, come back because, we, 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 you know, th there are just too many tangents that we could go on. And all of a sudden it's like, what was the episode? We're supposed to be talking? Tissues, right? Oh, we never mentioned tissues. So right. Right. I'm just saying that up front. So we can take our time with tissues and then move into, now it looks like you have a poster behind you. And just a heads up, on Instagram, everything is backwards. Yeah. So, so nothing. Uh, we yeah, if you could just print a few of those inverted, then uh, we could <laughs> reconnect. Oh, yeah. okay. So, hello there, from us. Your phone in the mirror right now. That's that, right. I don't know. Is that the old person's solution? Yeah, uh, that is. So, uh, we just got a hello from Australia, from Queensland, Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. So, there we go. It's early morning there, it's late in London. All right, so Mike, I put up a couple of old pictures just because when I've had a couple people on and then afterwards you're like, well, how, you know, there's a lot of questions. So I, I'm hoping in the future we do a very long podcast interview, but at the risk of boring everybody now, I'm just going to touch on it real quickly in that Ray met you doing stand up in New York City. That's right. Ray actually got me into, I, Ray was already established. He's a very old man is what you're saying. He's a very old he, man. Insane. It's, he's a 97 year old man and he looks fantastic. Um, but yeah, he actually got me into the comedy cellar, which was the first club in, uh, well, not the first club I got into, but the, the, the club that became my main club. And he, um, he, he, yeah, they didn't let a lot of people in back then. So he like went, we worked together by chance at a club called Catch Rising Star in Princeton, where you've worked many times. And uh, he got me um, 
you know, he liked what I was doing, I guess. So yeah, he got me into the comedy cellar and uh, the rest is history. Well, and for, for those that you don't know, uh, New York's, I mean, that most people don't know, uh, New York City has a small club scene of, of stand-up comedians, uh, of stand-up comedy clubs, and therefore comedians. And so you have to pass at a club, meaning, okay, you've been approved by the club, now you can call in your availabilities, and they'll say, okay, Mike, we have you on at 9 p.m. Wednesday, and, and whatever it is, 7 p.m. on Saturday, and you try when you're starting out to get into these clubs. So in these clubs, all at the same time that you were there is John Stewart, Ray, Brett Butler is there. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people for the, for, in the comedy scene, you know, David Tell, names David. that are familiar to us, but right. not necessarily familiar if you're in Australia, you don't necessarily know who David Tell is, but you know who Ray Romano is. And so, yeah. So you might know a tell, but the point being that once you're in at the club and you have to be, it's not that you're anointed. You just have to be funny enough. And also you have to be responsible enough to show up. Right. right. You can't, <laughs> well, I, I say that cause you ended up being the MC at right. the comedy cellar. Yes. The comedy cellar. It, it's one thing to get in, but then you also have to get spots. So, I think they were nice enough to let me in to the Comedy Cellar, but I, I wasn't able to really crack the lineup until Bill Grunfest, who was the proprietor, the guy that booked the place, also a comedian, also a comedy writer, he moved out pretty quickly after I passed there. He moved to, to, out to Los Angeles to start a TV writing job. And suddenly the guy who was the MC all the time was gone and they had to fill an enormous amount of spots. And so... I slowly work my way into those spots. Right. And there's there's the comedy cellar for for um, really this is inside baseball, but the comedy cellar was one of the coolest clubs and still is in Manhattan. And yeah. so it's a great the comedians love it. And then uh, upstairs is something called the Olive Tree Cafe, which was started by Manny, who owned it. And there was a real perfect environment to talk to other comedians. Then you're, when you're on, you go down the stairs, you go on stage. Now, as the MC, you're kind of tied to the stage. But uh, even today, maybe not today, but when all this clears up, if you have a chance in New York to go to the Comedy Cellar, uh, it's a great place to get the New York comedy vibe. For sure. I think it's pretty much, I mean, I've lost touch with the, comedy scene there pretty much but i think the cellar is still probably the top club you know the other ones that used to be sort of the top of the heap are uh went out of business yeah and the big one was catch a rising star which closed down but the big one so you you still have pictures of robin williams at the comedy cellar etc but catch a rising star and the comic strip were these big ones early on and of course the improv was improv the original improv which is no longer there was really from the early 60s. Right. So, but if you could drop yourself in New York today, the Comedy Cellar is this place. So you're there, and that's probably Ray's, ends up being Ray's favorite club, the Comedy Cellar. Right. So you see Ray a lot there. Yes. My thing was I would see every comic because I was there normally emceeing. I would only do a few of my own. Well, the point is I, was, I would host the whole night from nine to two often, often five, six nights a week, you know, depending on what week it was. So I saw every comedian and I'm like, just by osmosis, ended up knowing, I just had to sit through so much comedy and Ray was there all the time. So I got to know Ray's act, you know, very intimately. <laughs> <laughs> well, which you're making it sound, uh, it, you know, for an outsider, you're watching basically hundreds of hours of stand-up comedy. And right. you, you, as a comic, you're working on your jokes. So that means you're seeing Ray Romano, who people pay and he fills, you know, big venues. You're, you're watching him work on one joke uh, a different way for six months to get it right. Now, he's telling that within his act, but you're, you're so I'm just going back because I don't want people to think that you're like, I got to watch these guys again. You're really, it's just the overwhelming volume of stand-up comedy that you're seeing. Right. And, and to do that. And 
this is just a little side thing. Ray sometimes would have to MC, and the job was what you said, 8 to 2 a.m. So that's six hours of stand-up comedy. Yeah, and usually 9 to 2, but... but 9 yeah. to 2, yeah. So Ray, a couple times, many times, would say, Tom, I'll tell you what. I'll give you my free meal if <laughs> you take over from midnight till 2 a.m. Right. Because from midnight to 2 a.m., there might be six people, a couple people from Sweden, and two people that wandered in. And so Ray right. could at least go down to his family. So I would do that in exchange for a free meal, which, you know, when you're starving, doing stand-up, you're like, yeah, that sounds like a great deal yes. to me. So, so now, Mike, you do, you're doing that. You're doing stand-up. You're doing a lot of other things. And I want to get to Raymond uh, pretty quickly now. But that's how you get to know Ray. And that's how he gets to, to establish a relationship with you. And he trusts you. And also, as we know, Ray's a very nice guy, very straightforward, very straight-laced also. Doesn't do drugs, doesn't drink. You know, he's a real family guy. He's kind of what you would hope he would be when you see him on television. So then the, the next step, the next real big leap is you help him with his book. Yeah. Oh, a little bit. So I don't know if it's me or you, but can you hear me? Yeah. I, I, yes. You're freezing as well. I don't know whether it's me or you either, but let's, uh, there's nothing I can really do. Let me see if I can shut off everything I own. Uh, yeah, I, I can hear you fine though, Mike. All right, I think. Um, all right, just, just, I don't know, hold on. <laughs> I can hear you, yeah. Let's see. Okay, I'm texting. I think it's your end, Mike. I, I, I'm being told it's your end. So I, I do hear you perfectly. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm going to check my Wi-Fi. Okay. I can talk. Take your time, Mike. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish that story. So um, Mike was also working on uh, a show called Spin City in New York City with Michael J. Fox. Uh, and so during that time, uh, Ray, uh, Eros Raymond started. It... Um, I think it was the second year, third year, Ray was gonna host Saturday Night Live. And Mike was working on, um, Mike was working on um, Spin City. But he helped out on Saturday Night Live and he wrote a great sketch uh, that week, uh, the sweet sassy molassy sketch that, um, that Ray uh, did and got a lot of mention. So, sorry, I'm, I'm watching for Mike to come back. And then, uh, this is now season three, I want to say, of Raymond. Ray has to write a book. And to write a book, uh, when you have the workload that Ray had on the show, meaning he's starring, he's uh, writing episodes, he's also um, editing, he's doing everything possible. He's in the writer's room. And now, on top of that, he has to write a book. And the publishers want to get the book out as quickly as possible. So uh, Ray approaches Mike to help him write a book. So while we were uh, in the writer's room, Mike, who I knew from New York, was in Ray's office with Ray when Ray had time helping, his write, helping him write his book. And the, I think it was the following season that Mike became a writer on the show. So I'm gonna, I wanna say that was season four or something like that, yeah. Season four, yeah. Um, all right, just looking for Mike. So then uh, Mike came on the show and wrote a bunch of episodes and tissues. I remember, it. I remember oh, I'm scrolling through these questions, okay. Let me just see this, let's see this. Let's see if Mike can rejoin. And that's how I made him famous. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Tune in next week for... <laughs> so, Mike, I think people, I think people heard... I, 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 I 
filled in the book? Yes, I, I actually could hear you while I was trying to get back in. So okay, I, great. I, I it. Okay, so I winged it, but I think it was pretty accurate. That's right. Spin City and then the book, and I, I was opening for him, and then because he was touring around because he was famous already, and while we were touring around, he was showing me pages of the book, and he kind of liked what I was adding to the book, and eventually that led to him just basically me and him locked in his office for a couple of months writing the book. Right, uh, which is, a, which is uh, Ray is a perfectionist, and one of the reasons he's so good at stand-up comedy is Ray will sit there and go over a joke, one line, and just keep tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. So uh, to write a book with Ray is, I'm not saying it's not fun, but <laughs> Ray will, and it's part of his charm, is second-guessing and then going yeah. back and second-guessing and uh, Aaron Shore was on uh, a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about Ray had to submit one tape for his Emmy submission, and he went with Phil and consulted in this and this, and then after he completely uh, uh, made the ironclad decision, Phil hung up with Ray, and it was like, okay, great, it's going to be that episode, and then we find out like three days later that Ray changed his mind and then pulled and did another episode. So by doing that book, uh, uh, you pass the test of patience and ability to bring the funny, Ray. <laughs> so then, oh, we we are frozen. Go ahead, Mike. You're you're frozen again, but I can hear you. My house is crazy, but maybe. I'll Is, go to wireless. I wonder, Mike, is anybody, is George Lucas there streaming some special effects thing in your back room? Um, so now, uh, everybody, I think Mike can probably still hear me. Let me just check if the people, yes. So uh, everybody can hear me. <laughs> He's kind of, everybody can hear me again still, though. Give me a couple of hearts if you can still hear me. Um, so that's going to bring us to the tissues episode. Um, so Mike is married. He was married when the show started. He's still married to his uh, same wife. Uh, and so here we go. Let's try this. Here we go. All right, thank you. You can hear me great. Here comes Mike. And then I, I said, Ray. What, sorry, did something happen? Okay, I switched to wireless, so hopefully this is more consistent, even if it's less good quality. I don't know what I look like right now. I don't know uh, why we're not. You look, um, Mike, you look you know? great, but most importantly, you're not frozen. So bad yeah. quality is frozen, can't hear you. Good quality is hearing you. Yeah, we're getting a bunch of hearts. So, Mike. I just said that you were married before the show, you were married during the show, and you're still married to the same woman. And you're, right. let's call it happily married. So just to paint the picture of tissues. <laughs> so tissues um, was a great example of the way the Everybody Loves Raymond writer's room worked, which was you would talk about something that was happening in your house and bring a lot of that into the story. And then the other writers, led of course by Phil and Ray, would, would, you know, would make it into a story that was, that was worth telling, uh, um, instead of maybe just a beef, <laughs> or just a situation. So I would always, I have this theory, you know, like husbands are known stereotypically for not, they don't listen, right? We certainly featured that aspect of race character on the show quite a bit so so you know i'm not immune to being that person sometimes sometimes i'm not listening when i should be um and i i guess i figured in you know being married that, that she gets mad at me if i'm not, i do listen offer an opinion she doesn't she'd rather i didn't listen rather not hear my opinion. She that just rather, yeah, screws just up the whole formula you're... of things getting done, you know? So just, uh, it, it was, it's hilarious to me. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you are breaking up a little bit. And I, in all seriousness, are there other, are there people are you streaming there? stuff or is there, is someone in your house doing a lot of internet surfing? Here, here here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Here we go. In my house while we go. This is live Insta Instagram live <laughs> and Mike is walking to a better Wi-Fi signal. Uh, drum roll, please. He's going. It's 7,000 degrees outside, but I'm going to fall. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Mike's here we go. Oh, this is interesting. Now, yeah, yeah. It, it actually looks really good, Mike. It, yeah. What is your theory out? What is your theory outside? What's that? Oh, what, what is your theory about going outside? Service in my house sucks. The Wi-Fi is good, but for some reason it's screwing up right now. So the I'm on my phone. I didn't realize this would turn into a tech chat, but I'm on my phone with the wireless, I mean, with the, um, using my cell service, and it's beautiful. And now you can see that uh, I live about, I have a couch outside. Yeah, um, uh, it, it is better, it is better. Uh, and I, uh, Marcy or whoever, someone likes your um, uh, shirt, Mike. So let me see, are you? Human rights campaign. Yes. Still freezing. <laughs> really? I like, my, my, somebody just wrote, I just wanted to know how the fire started. <laughs> <laughs> please, please right. tell me. Still freezing this thing at all? Uh, you're freezing intermittently. I think it's better, Mike. Don't all move right. around a lot. Uh, I'm going to try one more thing if you'd like. Uh, let's see how this goes. Need a um, vamp, vamp for a second. <laughs> All right. So uh, the question is, are we sitting out by a pool with you, Paula? Uh, I think it's pool adjacent. Yeah. And uh, um, I think, I don't know what Mike, he, he might be going to yell, yell at his kids to get off the um, internet. I don't really know. Um, but this is the beauty of live, of live Instagram. Uh, and I think from now on, what we'll check for is not how much has this person created and how many Emmys, but how is their Wi-Fi connection? That seems to be priority number one. And then we'll go backwards. I see. Uh, by the way, this is very similar to the first moon landing in... Uh, only we're how many years later? 50 years later. By the way, if any of you have random questions, I can answer them while Mike is peddling his gyro thing. <laughs> yes. Great, Matthew. Has he gone to get a, a fire a fire signature yet? What's happening here today? So this is Tom Caldebiano. We're talking to Mike Royce, writer, uh, who's a great writer and not uh, the owner of Good Wi-Fi right now. Uh, and so I apologize to you guys. But Answer me, ask some questions now, and I'll answer them before Mike rejoins. Um, we were trying to get the tissues episode. And yes, this really should uh, be a fun interview uh, once Mike uh, gets up and running. Um, the, so I will say this. Uh, okay, let's see what, how, what happened with our friend Mike. And then... <laughs> All right, waiting, drum roll. Drum roll. Here he comes. Okay, so I just have a, uh, I just uh, put some tinfoil on top of my phone and uh, it seems to be working. This is, this is now a beautiful clear signal, Mike. I'm a little worried. I, I don't, it's probably cable. I have no <laughs> idea what, I, you know, I, I, I don't know why this is happening. There might be a lot of internet activity. Uh, actually, that's what's happening. My incredibly responsible family is all phone banking. I actually interrupted my own phone banking uh, on behalf of uh, 
certain how candidates. Rich, so I think, I think it's like an, a tonnage of internet stuff. Yeah. How rich do you have to be that you're transferring that much money by bits and bytes? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, so here, by the way, these are random questions. Have you worked on any other shows? So I don't want to get to that. Mike has worked on many other shows. Let's get to, and I'll let, yeah. get into it. And if you, if you, uh, if you want, but let's get to the tissues thing, Mike. And you do sound good. Yes. Okay. Well, the bottom line is I would get uh, very upset because I felt like I was a bait and switch situation where it's like, I want to hear your opinion. And then my opinion didn't, oh, actually your opinion means nothing. And it would be being like a furniture store and, you know, she'd be, well, what do you think of this couch? And, you know, we're looking for a new couch. You know, she wants me to be invested in the decision. And then I would kind of suggest, oh, this one's actually nice. And she would go, no. And then we move on. And I was like, okay, this is not really a two-way street in this. And I didn't want it to be a two-way street, but I, I was being led, you know, there's a push and pull that um, I was describing in the room, which seemed to then be related to by some of the other writers. And that's just marriage. That's marriage where it's like, you know, one person, you want, you want to be a team, but it's easier if one person's just in charge. <laughs> so the, you know, the power in that particular relationship switched back and forth. Um, so that's where tissues came about because it was, you know, Ray who would rather be Ray Barone, who would normally just never want to just go do it. I don't care. I just, I, I'm, I'm, my mind is too full and I don't want to, you know, I'd rather you handle everything. But then of course she wants him to be invested. And then when he tries to get invested, she realizes that all his opinions are terrible. Uh, or at least she, you know, as we depicted in the show, his, she just, she actually just mentioned one tiny disagreement that she had with something that he bought and he went ballistic because he had so much resentment built up. Um, and that was the tissue. And, that, that was the actual tissue. And she was actually, pretty, that's right. The tissues in, in the episode, she was pretty apologetic. I mean, she was like, no, it's fine. It's fine. And then of course the family kind of, piles on a little bit but because ray has had years and years of years of feeling that my voice is not heard at all he reacts a little bit strongly that's right that's right yes very strongly uh and asking how the fire got started which that wasn't in the show that was just an accident that we filmed <laughs> just a happy no <laughs> thank goodness thank goodness something happened yeah. funny by I can't believe the cameras were. Ha yeah, no, but that was the thing. That's about the uh, about the writers' room is that I have the situation. So we have the conflict between him and Deborah. We have the story um, progressing, you know, and yes. uh, and and then Phil at one point just goes, "Well, this has to end with them lighting the kitchen on fire," and like you know, that wasn't in my head at all from my silly little arguments that I was having. Um, and he's like, you know, it's got to, it's, he's got to like take over the way he wants and then it'd be a giant disaster and we got to set the kitchen on fire. <laughs> yes. And, and, and the fire, and I think here, Mike, I think for people watching, uh, there's a lot of questions that come up of how much ad libbing, how much stuff. And now you make the joke about the thing setting on fire, but the fire, the fire is so specifically set and someone asked was there a fireman there yes there was a special effects guy there there was a yes. fire marshal or fire warden or whatever he was and what it was and i'll post some pictures of this and this is the you know uh, uh, i'm just saying this because we have such a wide audience some people really want to know okay what episodes when you wrote this about the writing aspect then other people are like, well, what paint did they spray Marie with? You know what I mean? And so it's all over the map <laughs> and you never know. But to get specific about the fire, it was a gas-like line that was sitting on the counter. And there was a guy there with a switch. And it was very, very controlled. But there were, there were yeah. fire yeah, people they drilled all, all around. Like, they, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, there were, there were fire people all the way around. And it was not, it was not, and so go ahead, Mike. Yes, yeah, so the- Well, yeah, no, they, they, I mean, in the permanent set, they drilled like little fire gutters that you couldn't see, of course, but that would pop up uh, when at the right time. And so it would go on that little line and we wrote 
the the uh, stuff about the I guess the I think about the ants, right? It was the other oh, right? ants. Was that what? Yeah, the ants. ant prevention stuff, so that it would be follow this and you know carefully set up a couple of things to catch fire slowly, so it went along the line there. Um, and that, I, you know, I'm saying this because I had nothing to do with it. Was Phil, I believe, or you know, at least got the ball rolling, setting up the hose in the beginning, where they're arguing about the hose, you know, and, and the argument about the hose is, you know, just evidence that Ray doesn't know what he's doing when he goes shopping. I ask you to do one thing. I ask you to buy one hose. You came back. It was this big, you know. And then oh, you just use your thumb. You, you know, spray it over. <laughs> Or whatever yes. he says. And, I, yes. uh, and, and that was like, Phil, Phil used to say always, you have to make the setup funny, right? So that was a funny moment because Ray was incompetently buying a hose. And you thought, well, that's just, we're never going to think about that again. And then at the end, when he comes running in with that damn four-foot hose, you've, it's just the greatest payoff, one of the greatest things I've ever seen. And again, I had, you know, I was, my name's on the script and I, wrote plenty of stuff there but that was not my idea and uh i i don't think i mean that's one of the loudest laughs i've ever heard in an audience when he comes in with that thing when he comes with the hose yeah and just for the people right by the way i'll post a picture mike because we do two takes of everything and on one of the takes i climbed up into the rafters and i have a wide shot of ray getting <laughs> caught by the hose and the fire in the same shot uh and yeah. so uh you're being very humble about the suggest i do remember phil saying He's got to set the house on fire. I remember that aspect uh, of it. And I think uh, by the same token, you contributed a lot to scripts that your name wasn't on and you would come up with uh, stuff. And I remember there were two jokes that you and I got into a Phil script that was very interesting. And it was the one line, it was the cult episode and we get to read the script beforehand and we come into the room. And I had a joke which was, it was something about describing a cult and it's like, you know, the, the next thing you're the next morning, you're, you know, you're, you're handcuffed to a goat. And I was, and I'm reading this going, well, that sounds like Frank has to say, you just described my wedding night. And then you came in, <laughs> you came in with where did you get that shirt? And it was something like big, tall and Samoan or something like that was your joke. But I, I I'm just saying you contributed a lot to, to, uh, at least on Raymond, that's how it worked. Uh, right. In, in, in many of the shows that, uh, and we'll get into a little bit more about writing, uh, the writer's room, like uh, Steve Scrovan was on Seinfeld, there was really no writer's room. It was Jerry and Larry. There was no writer's room right. like on, on Raymond. And so uh, getting back to the Tissues episode, yes, that's, you know, thank goodness you had that fight with your wife. Yeah, big, tall, and Samoan. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, <laughs> Teresa is one of our biggest fans and can quote yeah. this. By, by the way, Mike, I, I have to say, even when I was talking to Tucker and for all of us, you wrote an episode, you watched it, you watched it live in front of the audience when they played it back, right? You watched it being filmed, right. you watched it yes, played yes, back, you, yes. and then there's a chance that you've never seen it again. The people watching might have seen that episode last night and 40 other times over the years, you know? So... Even with Tucker, I remember asking Tucker things while the show was going. I'd be like, Tucker, I'm showing you this proof sheet. Do you remember this episode? I don't. I don't remember the episode, Tom. And then yeah. he was saying, you know, I was looking at some episode names, don't remember the episode name, and then realized that I had written the episode that I didn't even remember the name of. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty obsessive about my own work. I, I. I do watch stuff. I would watch the show every Monday when it was on just because I liked doing that, you know. But now that now enough time has passed, because uh, I think I've also bought the show in every configure. I have all the DVDs and I have all I bought it on Amazon. And now, of course, it's on Peacock. So I joined Peacock <laughs> to watch the thing I already have. Um, and there'll be episodes where I'm like, what the what's this one? And then I wrote it or co-wrote it. Normally I co-wrote it. Yeah. The ones that are just me, I'm pretty clear on, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of episodes. Well, what, what, what happens also is uh, just for me with my photos, I have everything labeled by the episode name and so many of them are like, thank you. Thank you notes. Thank uh, And I'm going, I don't, 
I don't remember. And then every once in a while, there's one where I go, I don't even remember that title. Like, I don't remember that title. Yeah. What is, uh, security, I think, was one of them or something like that. So now, Mike, yeah. I wanted to get back to uh, – oh, sorry. This is a question that people ask, and I've talked about it. Uh, it I just want to say, yes, everybody loves Remy is on Peacock. Yes. Uh, XRS Peacock 54. TV. Oh, yeah. Jump yeah. in with any, any, any question. You can actually – you can uh, pe peacock. I'm not a shill for peacock by any stretch. Uh, I don't really care one way or the other. Is one where it's not. I think there's a free version, or there's at least a cheaper version, and then there's a more expensive version. There might be a free version with ads or something, but yes. anyway, the point is, I'm not sure you have to pay for it. Right. Yeah, I think you can watch a certain amount. Yeah, full episodes. Yeah, and, I, and also uh, what I was. I just want to get back to this point. When we say, people always ask about how much ad-libbing, and you made the joke about, oh, the fire just broke out, which is a funny, it escalates it a little bit, versus, oh, they changed the line. <laughs> and what happens yeah. is, the reason you can't ad-lib so much is not because the actors aren't amazingly talented and et cetera, but there's so many things by show night that are, just, uh, that are dependent on another uh, uh, actor's line. So the yeah. cameras, there's four cameras. And I think one thing that's been uh, made clear by me posting all these pictures is there's a ballet of action going on behind the scenes that shocks people. And so uh, there's, Ray says a line. At the end of that line, all of the cameras know that they have to move. So if, you know, like this camera now has to swing over here to get Frank and Marie walking in the door, and that's their cue. So if Ray decides, right. you know what, I'm just going to change that change that line. I'll change that line. All of a sudden, the director goes why to the camera, why didn't you move? Well, we never heard the line. It, it's a cataclysmic effect yeah. on a show. So, <laughs> and it's, it's also from a writing perspective because scenes are built out of jokes and jokes are carrying the information of the scene. So when we're writing the episodes, we would often take jokes out because, oh, well, we, are, we already know that joke might be funny even in and of itself. It actually makes the scene less funny because it's slowing everything. Self, and especially on Raymond, there are a lot of like this secret. We're just coming out and now this person's mad because this or that person knew that thing. If somebody just ad libs a joke that has nothing to do with that, it, sl it, it screws up the whole basically. Yeah. And so for that precise, so I, it doesn't, I don't want it to come across that we're like, you know what, because uh, we write genius stuff, nobody should ad lib. It's not that at all. If you were doing, you know, if you see Ray and, and Phil and, and Brad, you know, Brad on, on a panel, they can ad lib all they want and they can make it up. It's just that so many things are dependent on other things. And by show night, I don't have one nearby, but on show night, the script is numbered. Every single line is numbered, meaning every line in the script is numbered. So what we will do is the, 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 the technical coordinator who's the, talking to the director who has a switcher up front because there's something else that's going on, which is there are all these monitors. And in front of a live audience, the person who's the switcher has to send the right image to the live audience. So if, they, if they're not seeing in front of them, let's say Ray and Deb's bedroom is on the side, they don't know what's going on in there. And so if the switcher hears a lot, like everything is dependent. So sometimes on show night, you'll hear them go, go back to line 34. Like there is no gray area of like, go to this paragraph. And somewhere it, it's <laughs> very, right. very uh, precise. So then, yes. Mike, on a personal level, did your wife, when she saw the tissues episode, and, and I should say, your wife is a very accomplished architect and professional, super competent, you know, uh, 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 woman who's not uh, a, a nag who's home all day just to give you gruff about your tissue selection. <laughs> She's got her hands full. Yeah. She's got a full career and kids. She, she does not need my bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, Oh, that episode. Sorry, I'm getting a little better. When she saw that episode, did she say, oh, nice, way to air the dirty laundry, Mike, or was she fine? Uh, she's fine. She was fine. Um, no, completely fine. I mean, you know, it was never, 
nothing I ever put in the show was like super duper personal. These are things that just represent, universal. yeah, universal couple things that I would just be going through. Just like, you know, that's, a, that, I mean, the counseling one also was, was, came out of my life, except that we had never actually went to counseling. The counseling one, the first half of it happened almost completely to me where we had a couple over and we had had an argument that morning. Then the couple starts talking about how great counseling is. Then I'm in my head going like, oh no, she's going to want to go to cop, cop counseling. Then the second part of it happened to many of the other writers in the room who had been to couples counseling, which we have not. Right. <laughs> but we combine those two things, you know, but they're universal, you know, universal things. Right, right, right. And I think a, a lot, I, I only ask because the PMS episode, you know, uh, I was talking to Monica, Bill Rosenthal's wife, and the PMS episode called Bad Moon Rising was um, inspired by his experiences with Monica. And I think everybody in the writer's room had people uh, in their lives who told us, you know, their story ended up on screen, you know? And so they have to watch and go, how are you characterizing me? And I think the best example was uh, the can, over, can opener episode where Ray, I mean, Phil actually came in and told us the story about how he had to make his own dinner and all that stuff. And we, as writers, protective of Phil's wife, said, Phil, I don't think, not that you're not telling the truth, but it seems like your point, you, you really sound like a martyr and just a great guy. <laughs> and we know that that's not true, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I just want to, yeah, I just wanted to be clear that your wife saw the episode and didn't go, why would you, you know, characterize that? No, she was laughing and yeah, it's, and, you know, and yeah. And so <laughs> Mike, let's, um, well, it sounds like there's a beautiful water. I'm imagining a beautiful waterfall. For oh, that's funny. We have a pool and there's a little waterfall. I barely hear it, but I think the microphone must be. This yeah, must no, be it sounds fine. So, therapeutic almost. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, I want to talk about, because we'll, we'll go back to rain in a little bit, but uh, one day at a time, uh, and someone asked if you'd worked on any other shows, and I noticed, uh, so we'll get into one day at a time, but I noticed two names, Norman Lear and Rita Moreno, who have done other projects besides this, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, what I, what I'm, the reason I want, I want to get into it, but what I want people to understand is, because you have experienced, I think, more than anybody I know, people say, just do, a, just do a Raymond sequel, or why don't you do, or this would be a funny show when you're not in the business. And it's just so easy. You, right. know, you kind of snap your fingers, you have a few meetings, and then Ray is on the air, and you have a new show. And right. you with, and I think another time we'll get into Men of a Certain Age, which you did with Ray, but in parallel with that, with uh, One Day at a Time, Men of a Certain Age was kind of a show that was going to come on the air, and then something happened, and it took five years to get this show on the air with a giant star who's coming off of a giant hit, okay? So, yes, yes, a bit, like three or four years, but yes, that's right. Yeah, yes. so One Day at a Time is a show that uh, existed, giant hit, then it comes out again, and then the, the and the, we're leading up to this Monday night, is what I'm uh, coming up to. Because, you know, uh, I have some late breaking news about that, but yes, theoretically you're right. <laughs> okay, oh, <laughs> should, should we hold it to the end, Mike? What, what, what if, uh... No, no, it's totally fine. We could talk, uh, uh, literally, so I don't know if you want to, if there's more drum roll, but I, uh, um, uh, you know, I can talk about one day at a time and, and Ray, because Ray is part of it when we come back on. So for, so for those watching right now, this is Tom, who is a writer. You're talking, uh, we're talking with Mike Royce. And right now we're about to get into Ray Romano's appearance on a show that Mike is working on right now. That's how it's related to the channel. Yeah. Well, a lot, a lot of people may remember one day at a time from the seventies and the late eighties, early, the 80s. It was a Norman Lear show, with Bonnie Franklin. Most people remember Schnooper, who was, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, had the hots for her and they, you know, was bothered. He was uh, annoying, but beloved by the family. And then she had two teen daughters. Valerie Bertinelli pay, played one of the teen daughters and uh, Mackenzie Phillips. Um, so a few years ago, Norman's company wanted to 
redo one day at a time using just the premise of a single mom and her two daughters and probably have the character of Schneider around. But they thought it would be a good opportunity to feature a family that was less represented on television. In this case, uh, a, a, Latino, a, a Latino family, right? So we started, uh, we, the show started on Netflix and we were on Netflix for three seasons. Uh, my partner on the show is Gloria calderon Kellett, who's Cuban. And it's basically about her Cuban American family. And uh, we, Netflix cancels, I don't know by the way if you can hear, but there's also a guy playing classical music like two yards over. So there's just a whole thing happening right now. Uh, um, is he playing Vivaldi? Because it sounds, it, well, keep going, Mike, because we're going to run out of time. Yeah. Um, so Netflix canceled us after three seasons. Then we were put on the Pop Network, which is a network very few people know about. It used to be the TV Guide Network. It's a cable network. And we started there, started doing uh, back in uh, April uh, or March, and we started doing, doing really well there. And then, of course, we're now in this situation, pandemic-wise, where we had to stop making shows. So CBS, being a sister network of pop, CBS is in the same corporate structure, right? So CBS is going to put us on, put the episodes that we shot on. And Raymond Romano was good enough to play a character in our very first episode. So when we premiere, you know, so this all changed a second ago because there's a football game that's now going to preempt uh, what was supposed to be our premiere. <laughs> oh. So COVID has screwed, screwed me again on, a, on this level because Cam Newton got COVID on the Patriots. They canceled the Patriots game on Thursday and now they rescheduled it for Monday during when One Day at a Time was supposed to premiere. So what I'm hoping is we'll actually premiere a week from tomorrow instead of tomorrow. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. we don't have the plan yet. Because okay. really what would have been so poetic, yes. and I still hope is true, is that Monday night at 9 o'clock on CBS, show, and Ray Romano walks in the front door in the first 30 seconds, which is what happens on One Day at a Time, because he plays a census taker who comes by the house, uh, by the apartment, and he was super funny and, um, you know, got to play a sort of Ray. Well, he's Ray. So he was hilarious. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, not the pre Well, it gives you more time to promote because you want people to tune in. And for people in Australia and the United Kingdom uh, and Istanbul, uh, we basically had three networks, three prime networks, CBS, ABC, and NBC. And everything depended on your ratings. And so... If you do well in your ratings on your first few episodes, there's a chance that your show gets picked up. So it's not just, uh, there's a lot riding on the ratings of that premiere, I would say. That's right. That's right. And we're, we're yeah. hoping the way things all shake out to be on CBS, you know? And that, and that would be a good thing. Uh, that would be uh, uh, much bigger ratings because even though you're doing a quality show, if you're on the top, TV network or something like that, it's not necessarily uh, reaching as many, you know, um, uh, uh, viewers. And I think, here's a little trivia, Mike. The, when Pop TV premiered, the first show they did was the story behind Everybody Loves Raymond. That's what they opened. Oh, that's, yes. that's right. Because That's was, hilarious. Yes, it was <coughs> for the TV Guide Network. And then they said, they're, oh, we're changing to pop TV. And so I think, by the way, uh, w one of the things that's abundantly clear is the amount, you know, you as the, the co-creator, co, you know, uh, whatever your official title is, you're responsible for making a funny show. And there's so much other stuff than just being in the... Uh, writer's room and here's the funny script and now let's go to the floor and let's deliver this funny script. It's the amount of machinations to keep the show on the air and to have this and uh, working with Norman Lear, you're working with somebody who's, there is no more experienced person on the planet than him <laughs> at trying to keep a show right. on the air and multiple shows. And for the people that are younger, Norman Lear had many, many shows on the air, and All in the Family was a giant hit during turbulent times in the early 70s in the U.S. It originated in the U.K., and then he adapted it, and it became a giant, iconic show in the U.S., and he had many, many other shows uh, that um, 
came after that, like the Jeffersons and One Day at a Time, all, all, all of that stuff. But he has been through the mill as far as like, okay. Uh, and so I, I bring this up, Mike, because you have so much more on your shoulders than just like, let's have a funny act break here, right? You, you, have, to, you have to weigh all the input from this network and now what's the addictive, you know, what's CBS going to say? Let's say you are a hit on CBS. They're going to be like, uh, we need less of this and more, you know, you're, all of a sudden it's going to be, you know, having said that, it's a really good thing. Um, that's a very nice comment. I've watched One Day at a Time on Netflix. It's laugh out loud funny and very relatable. Um, I saw the bird. Yes, the thank bird. you. Yeah, the bird. Very nice to say. Uh, hello, Susanna. The bird episode. Where did that come from? That was a Thanksgiving episode. Yeah, uh, we'll get to that. I think uh, Jeremy Stevens wrote that. Oh, one, yeah. The bird episode. Um, uh, and Mike, you and I, and was it just you and I, or did, the first time? Did we write that? The first time. We wrote that with Ray, I think, right? Maybe. And I think a lot, yeah, possibly, I should know this, uh, with Charles Durning. Uh, and I think a lot of times or a couple of times, uh, there are times when Ray, who I don't know how, you, now you, as this, uh, being on One Day at a Time, throw in acting on a show on top of being responsible for writing scripts is a very tough thing, right? And so a, a, a couple of episodes, you and I would help Ray just because he was in the weeds. And it's it's not that he needed any help with funny or anything, you know, like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. He just needed to, you know, he, he just, yeah, he was doing same thing with men of a certain age. We did everything together in the, in the writer's room, but then he's in front of the camera all the time. So, yeah. So it's just a matter of time. And by the way, yeah. So, like once again, this is Tom for people that are just coming in. I'm talking to Mike Royce. I'm Tom. Cause I see the question, where is Ray, which is a bet. Where is Ray? And so, uh, Mike, maybe you can help illustrate or, or clear up, which I've done many times. Ray does zero social media. Zero. I've tried to convince him for 15 years, Ray, do this, do this, do this, just, just to promote his gig. He will never do social media. I don't know why exactly, but there is a chance, and Ray did pop in when I was interviewing Brad Garrett. Ray came in and said hi, uh, and Manfalati came in and said hi. So Ray would be very happy to talk <laughs> to the fans. He just needs a son or a daughter to come by with their phone so he can join uh, a conversation on Instagram. So, yes. Think, yeah. And I think, uh, Mike, I want to talk more uh, the next time. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about counseling, but there are many, many other episodes. I also want to talk about the Saturday Night Live experience and how different that is writing uh writing for Saturday Night Live versus writing for a show, you know, like that. And I, versus, you know, the intense um, uh, pressure cooker that is Saturday Night Live. And you, you were, you were on, uh, I, I also, we should talk about Spin City next time also. But, great, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have much more, to, we have much more to cover, uh, Mike. But just in conclusion, well, yeah, go ahead. Yes, and I want to say before you conclude, I just want to say my internet is almost always fantastic so the, the the next time i promise you i promise you this will not break up like this and be weird i don't know again i think it's because my whole house is like using the internet today by the way mike if you want to if you can promise me good internet and if you know when that show is really going to premiere then i think uh if you want to come on for five minutes we can do a quick live you know we okay i i will take you up on that yeah. yes. Th th yes that 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 would be awesome and let me see. We yeah. Oh, we're running out of time. Okay. But uh, yeah, we have many more things. We'll talk about SNL. We'll talk about men of a certain age a little bit. We'll talk more about the book also and what it's like to write a book because a lot of people following are very creative. And I think Mike, uh, I was going to say in conclusion, you've worked on a lot of different shows, and we talk about the family environment on Everett's Raymond, uh, and it's a unique environment. And I think people are seeing that. We're, you know, we're laughing still. Uh, you see in all these photos, you know, a lot of laughter. And I always think, well, if you're working on a sitcom and you're not laughing, it's, you know, it's a pretty bad sign. But how did you feel about that? Also going to other shows. Oh. Um, I'm, I feel like I froze, uh, right? 
experience that we try to live up to. So, uh, you know, Raymond, like if I'm running a show, I, I think back to how Phil treated everybody and how, how every other aspect of the show and try to family. And I'm sure I can't live up to that. That's always the, mo the role model is Raymond. Great. Uh, and you were, you were freezing a little bit. So I think we're going to not push our luck, Mike. <laughs> And uh, I think take yeah. some of the take some of the water fountain money and put it into the Wi-Fi uh, system, uh, <laughs> uh, whatever it takes. Then, yeah. So, Mike, uh, uh, but do come back if you want to come back uh, any day right before the premiere. We'll talk for five minutes uh, and it doesn't have to be. Um, uh, but it'll be great to see you clearly and get the timing uh, right, because it's hard. It's hard to be. It's hard to banter with the freezing, obviously. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, understood. Uh, from the United Kingdom, Australia, Turkey, Toronto, of course. I think that's in Canada. Um, and Mike, by the way, went to uh, is from upstate New York, so we should talk about that uh, next time. Uh, all right. Goodbye, Pam. Good seeing you. All right. All right. Goodbye. There, that's a <laughs> – all right. Thanks so much, Mike. Talk to you soon. I, I may not, but I'm just going to stay like this. All right, thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.